Good morning. Welcome to today's view on Africa on the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. My name is Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the Institute for Security Studies. And this is uh, the first view on Africa of 2017. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Um, a lot has happened in the last few weeks um, in, in the Congo, while many of us were not paying as much attention as we might usually. So there's a lot to talk about today. Um, well, I'll be focusing primarily on the um, December 31st uh, um, political accord that was signed, but I want to take us back just to give us some context to the accord that was signed on October 18th and start there and talk about some of the problems with that accord and what, what has been done in the aftermath. Um, and then also, of course, looking at the challenges and the advantages of the December 31st accord as well. Um, so uh, in the last briefing that I did, I think in November, we were talking about the October 18th Accord, and I said at that time that two of the biggest sticking points were the fact that there was no clear language about um, Kabila taking a third mandate in that accord, and also that the uh, elections according to that eight, October 18th Accord had been set for 2018, which most people felt uh, was far too long a period. Um, another key problem with the October 18th Accord was that it wasn't signed by the key opposition groups groups by the Rassemblement or by the G7 or by any of the large opposition groupings in the country. It was signed by some smaller opposition groups um, and notably also by the UNC of Vital Camere. But all in all, it wasn't considered to be an accord that really stabilized the political situation in the country. And so quite quickly afterwards, although we did see SADC and the uh, ICGLR endorsing that accord along with the African Union at that summit in late October, um, we also saw behind the scenes pressure on especially the Kabila government to enlarge that accord and perhaps to return to the negotiating table to look again at some of the key issues. Uh, and that pressure from the region in particular came from Angola, um, which did um, make it quite clear that it the accord for October 18th was a start, but certainly not a full, complete or a comprehensive solution to the issues. And then internationally, there was quite a lot of pressure placed on the Kabila government, um, both diplomatically, but also in a more... Um, um, aggressive way by the imposition of sanctions on some key members of his government, in particular uh, members of the security sector. Uh, those sanctions were enlarged by the, by, by the U.S., which had already started with sanctions on two key members of the security sector earlier in the year. And then the EU also in uh, November imposed sanctions on seven more officials. So quite a lot of pressure on some key people in the government, um, notably um, in the security sector, but also people like Evaris Bouchab, who are very close to the president president and played an important role in the um, architecture of this electoral delay, as we as we sometimes call it. Um, one of the key objectives with these sanctions was to try and avert large scale violence on December 19th. The political opposition in the DRC had long been mobilizing around that date because that was the date of the expiry of Kabila's mandate. Um, according to the constitution, he would have had to leave office that day if elections had been held. And so it was a rallying point that the opposition had been working towards uh, for many months. And so one of the objectives of imposing these sanctions on security sector people in particular was to try and act as a deterrent against violent crackdowns that we have seen in the past. Um, we had a very violent crackdown on protests in September, and a large number of people were, ki were killed. The numbers are disputed, but at least um, 50. And so December 19th was a date that loomed very large, because also there had been quite a lot of response from the population around that date. Um, in the end, we did have protests. They weren't quite as large as perhaps one might have anticipated. Um, there was a violent crackdown and there were further deaths and there were quite a lot of arrests as well in the aftermath of that. But I would say it wasn't quite the apocalyptic scenario that many had feared. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that um, in the meantime, while we had regional pressure coming from Angola, international pressure in different form of sanctions, we also had a restart to negotiations that happened, uh, that started in, in November. And those negotiations were being led by the Catholic Church at the behest of the president. Um, but it must be noted that the Catholic Church also had itself already been engaged in a lot of shuttle diplomacy, and so it was the obvious actor to choose. And the Catholic Church, Senko, as we'll refer to it going forward, has traditionally, historically been a very uh, 
neutral and useful, credible voice um, and has interfered or intervened in previous um, political crises in the DRC quite successfully. So it remains, I think at this point, it's fair to say the only real neutral and credible voice in that country and therefore the only, only possible mediator um, that could be accepted by all parties. And so I think that the talks that Senko started in November and the fact that, that those might actually lead to an enlarged um, and revised accord and the fact that um, most of the key um, political parties and political groupings did participate in that. That certainly was a factor that played a role in diminishing the scale of the protests on December 19th. It did not, though, diminish the, the crackdown from the security forces, it must be said. Um, the Kabila government did react very violently to, to those protests as well. Nonetheless, um, it was not the, the worst case scenario by any means. And the Senko um, mediation was able to continue in spite of that incident. And then on De December 31st, um, they came up with a political accord now known as the December 3rd, 31st political accord, which is quite an improvement on what we had seen in October um, uh, on October 18th. And the main points about that, that are different and the main achievements, I would say, of this accord are, first of all, the fact that it's much larger, there's a much greater uh, number of people who have signed it, including Etienne Shisekedi's grouping, including the G7. At this point, the only large political grouping that hasn't signed it is the... Um, is the one that's led by the MLC, Jean-Pierre Bemba's movement, although they are possibly going to be joining as well. Um, there, I'll come back to, 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 to a few others who haven't signed, but in terms of the opposition that had been boycotting the previous talks led by the AU and by Edem Kojo, the Senko um, uh, talks were much more inclusive. And so that's the first point that it makes a significant and, and very positive difference. The, Concretely, in the accord, the elections are now due to be held in 2017, which is, for all intents and purposes, really a confidence measure. Um, it's, it's psychologically an important date. 2018 seemed like, well, how much time are we going to give the government to perhaps change the constitution to allow Kabila to go for another mandate? It didn't create stability and confidence in the process. So 2017 is a, is a, is a psychologically important uh, 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 date. Whether or not that will be achieved, we can we can explore in the future, but that is an important um, and positive change. Equally important is explicit language about Joseph Kabila not going for a third mandate, uh, which also wasn't included in the, in the first accord. And then finally, um, another important element is language that says that the constitution may not be amended ahead of the elections, also very important because that speaks to the concern about potentially the government trying to change the terms of the term limits as well. Um, in terms of some more co other concrete measures that um, that 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 will happen or that come out of the accord is the formation of a new government. Um, the opposition uh, is under this accord um, nominated to appoint the prime minister. The opposition also gets the um, presidency of the follow-up committee. So there's a follow-up committee, which I'll just refer to as follow-up committee. Um, it has an acronym in French, but it's not necessary to, to, to use that one. It might be confusing. The follow-up committee will be presided over by Etienne Chisekedi. He specifically was appointed to do that. Um, it is composed of 28 members, and it has three vice presidents. Who those members are and how those vice presidencies will be distributed has not been specified and is the, the subject of much political wrangling at the moment. Um, pr president Kabila remains the president until a new president is elected and takes office. Um, and those are basically the arrangements around power. Um, some other elements in there that are important to note are that um, political prisoners should, those political prisoners who have not yet been freed, the, their cases should continue to be reviewed. And there were a number who were specifically mentioned, notably Moise Katumbi, who, as many of you will know, is the former governor of Katanga, who went into exile after he was pursued um, on a number of different, rather trumped up legal, legal challenges. Um, so his case has specifically been recommended as one that needs to be reviewed, as have a few others. Um, um, specifically La Lucha and the Filimbi, the activists from both of those 
movements who have been imprisoned. And so that too is meant to be a confidence building measure um, about the government's real intention at reopening the political space. There's also language about uh, about allowing opposition radios to, to operate. Um, a new electoral commission will be composed. And um, there are some guidelines about equal access to media and so on. Um, so it's, a, it's fairly comprehensive when it comes both to the arrangements, the political arrangements during the period between now and a new presidency taking place. And it's quite clear as well about um, some of, the, some of the, the things that have to be fixed, have to be improved with regards to the political landscape. So all of those things are, are I think, extremely positive. Um, the accord has received a lot of support internationally from most of the key players, the Americans, the French, the Belgians, and also from the, the UN Security Council, which has urged all the parties to move forward with implementation. Um, it is, there are a few um, opposition parties that participated in the October 18th accord who have not yet agreed to sign the accord. Um, and that's one of the things I'll, I'll discuss in a little bit more detail. Um, but before I do that, I want to mention that in, I think it was late November, or early December, as a result of the October 18th accord, there was a massive cabinet reshuffle and a new prime minister was appointed. Uh, the new prime minister is Sami Badibanga, who comes from a, who is a former UDPS uh, um, uh, member, but was broke with that party and was an MP in the in in the parliament. He is the new prime minister, and there's a very large cabinet. I think 63 ministers and vice ministers, all composed of people from the presidential majority and from the opposition that signed the October 18th Accord. Now, why do I mention this? I mention this because, of course, many of those people, having just come into office are now not terribly thrilled about the prospect of potentially having to leave office again because the new accord from December 31st calls for the formation of a new movement. And so we now have a dynamic where we have opposition groupings potentially not moving aside to make way for the accord that essentially governs this period of transition. So we have a new kind of political dynamic uh, and potentially political obstacle in, in that group. And in fact, they've made it already very clear that they're not interested in signing the October 30, uh, the, the, sorry, the December 31st accord. A group of people, Badi Banga and some others, notably Azalia Skubewa, have said, we don't want to sign this accord because we don't feel it sufficiently addresses the question of the electoral calendar. Now, the electoral calendar question is something that will still be handled by the Electoral Commission, and there are some deadlines in the October, in the December 31st accord that speak to that. So I think that it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a reasoning that hasn't found much traction, if you will. Um, it's not necessarily a reason to reject the accord, um, and so people are interpreting their un, uh, unwillingness to sign it rather as something that protects their current uh, position in power. Um, it's relevant, extremely relevant, because as Prime Minister, Badi Banga would be the one who would dissolve a government and form a new one. Um, and so he is a, a, a large obstacle. Constitutionally, he can block the formation of a new government. Um, he can be removed by parliament. Um, so that, that so it throws it back into parliament. The question, if Badi Banga decides that he doesn't want to step aside for a new prime minister, then parliament, then the question goes to parliament. In parliament, um, and, and that essentially then brings the question back to Joseph Kabila, because in parliament, the majority is held by his ruling alliance. So that's the current dynamic around the question of the prime minister. And, and the formation of a new government is without that, the accord is essentially meaningless, because it means that, that those who are running the government between now and the elections don't agree with the, frame, the time frame and all the other provisions for elections that are set out in the accord. So it throws the whole thing into question. So it's, it's, it's an immediate obstacle. Now, Parliament is in session until January 15th, and it's highly unlikely that this will re be resolved by then, which would mean we'd have to wait until a new parliamentary session starts in March. So that is already an unfortunate time frame. It's a lapse if you will, in, 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 in momentum and in implementation that could have an impact on whether or not the elections are actually able to take place. But at the moment, it's a political problem. Um, 
I mean, there is the this possibility that that Kabila will, will that, that pushes MPs, and that we that we we have we have a suggestion of a, of a candidate, and that we may have a consensus on a candidate before the fifteenth. But I think, given today's date, today is the eleventh. That's unlikely. But we we still have a few more days. But Badibanga has made it clear he doesn't agree with the accord, and he doesn't want to sign it. So that's that's one of the first um, obstacles. Um, the MLC has not signed. Um, the, the Front pour, pour la Protection de la Constitution and the MLC, led by Eve Bazaliba, who's the, the president of the MLC at the moment, um, has not signed. They didn't participate in the talks. Um, and they are essentially saying that they will sign. They had originally wanted to insist that they get a very senior position running the follow-up committee, but as the accord explicitly says that um, that goes to Etienne Chisikedi, the leader of the UDPS, that's not a possibility. Um, there may be some compromise where they take one of the vice presidencies, but that is also some of the political wrangling that is going on right now. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because the MLC is significant politically. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And it's also relevant because the... Um, ruling party, so the ruling alliance, Pre President Kabila's party, has said it signs the accord with, res with reservations because it has not, because it's not inclusive. In other words, it doesn't include all the players on the political field in the DRC. So it's another potential hedging, moment of hedging, that the ruling alliance is, is hedging its bets on this accord pending the MLC signing of this. So all of these are little flashpoints um, that potentially could undermine the accord or leave the accord not to be implemented uh, fully. Um, I think one must, and of course everybody has, I mean, observers and analysts have all said, you know, why did Kabila make these concessions now? Did Kabila make these concessions because he knew, he knows the Congolese political class and knows that in many ways, what, what we're seeing now, these power struggles are about individuals and about parties getting power and access to resources rather than trying to move forward with an accord that actually provides a decent solution for the situation. Um, did he know that this was going to become the immediate problem and that as a result, the accord might not be implemented and this time it wouldn't be, the fault would not be put on him? Is that one of the reasons that he signed it? Or did he? is there real political will? I mean, those are questions that we can't answer immediately. Um, and it, it, it's something that we'll be watching closely. But certainly the, the pool of spoilers, if you will, is now greater than it was before uh, before the December 31st political accord. And therefore the, the pool of people who can be point, who, who can be blamed for the uh, uh, um, failed implementation of this accord is larger. Um, and that, of course, makes it more difficult for the international community to respond um, and to put pressure on Kabila because he's now not the sole actor who can make this happen or who can make it fail. Um, and so it's if, if, in fact, it is a political calculation, then it's quite a shrewd one, I would say. Um, and, and, and no one's necessarily saying that it is, but it's certainly a possibility. It, it's, this is not an accord or a situation that we take at face value. We're not able to because we've seen in the past how these games are played. Um, that said, um, it is entirely possible that the sanctions, Angola's pressure, really did convince Kabila, and in particular Angola's pressure, because Angola is a bit of is a kingmaker in that region and has uh, tremendous uh, influence over uh, Kabila and, and and can influence whether or not he's able to stay in office. D did he make a final decision that he's ready to walk away from power? I mean, it's it's entirely possible. Um, so just these are some of the things that we'll be watching over the course of the next year. Um, I hope I've given you a good overview of the December 31st accord and some of the things that we'll be watching. I think just the last word on 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 um, on political will and and the environment is that you know we we've 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 often seen the the Kabila government take two tracks. So engage in discussions first with, on the October 18th accord with under the AU's mediation, then with Senko, but in actual fact treat the political opposition, civil society activists, human rights activists and journalists extremely badly, imprisoning them, people have disappeared, people have been held without trial for extended periods of time, people have been killed. And so that bellwether is still there for us. We, we are continuing to see the pursuit of key opposition leaders, no, notably uh, Gabriel Kyungu in, in Lubumbashi, who's a, who's a, you know, a member of, of the G7 and a close ally of Moise Katumbi's. Um, so those are things that we, we can assess. Um, on the one hand, the accord says we're going to open the political space. Now, how, how far is the government willing to go with that? Uh, so those are, those are some of the other things that, that we'll be watching um, over the next few months. So thank you very much.